Uh, okay, so yeah, today I wanted to talk about, about a little bit my view of uh, uh, scene understanding. Um, so, so I just wanted to motivate, you know, what excites me these days, and yeah, I hope you know people in my group, and hopefully you will also be you know excited about this. So basically, um, I'm interested in developing autonomous systems that are able to help uh, you know humans in everyday tasks, and this goes from uh, personal robotics on the left to you know autonomous driving and you might be too young to know what the autonomous driving on the right is uh, uh, <laughs> but anyways for some of us that uh, you know grew up with this uh, this you know this is a interesting piece uh, of material all right so uh, what's my view on how to get there um, so autonomous systems systems need to do three things they need to sense the environment they need to recognize the 3d world and they also need to interact with it right and I argue that in order to do these things, it's very important for different uh, principles. So one of the things that you need to think about is representation, right? And you need to think about this in order to be efficient, um, uh, plus in order to solve the problem or try to solve the problem. Um, I do a lot of machine learning, so I think that learning and inference are very, very important. So trying to come up with uh, you know, general uh, principle methods to, to do this. And I also believe, since I believe in learning, that data is very important. And it's very important for two different reasons. Uh, one, in order to know how well you do with respect to other people, but also in order to do learning, right? You need to train uh, with something. Uh, the other thing that I believe is that uh, holistic approaches are actually the next step uh, uh, towards this goal. And what do I mean by holistic approaches? I mean trying to solve multiple tasks at once. Right, so not doing a serial process of you know I solve something and then something else, but trying to really infer all the uncertainties about these tasks together. And I also believe that right now MRFs, Marco Random Fields, are a fantastic mathematical tool in order to do this. And most of what I'm going to show today is going to be you know in this direction. So I'm going to show you, uh, in particular, a few things. So I'm going to start with something that you are familiar with. So I will talk about data. Uh, then I will talk about 3D reconstruction. Um, then I'm going to talk about semantic parsing uh, in indoors and outdoor scenes. And I will show you uh, something at the end, okay, which is a surprise. Um, okay, something that I'm very excited about and it's very, very new. Uh, so why autonomous driving? Uh, well, I guess most of you do autonomous driving here, so I don't need to motivate this, uh, right? But uh, what are the systems right now very good at? Uh, localization, path planning, obstacle avoidance, right? And we saw this heavy use of Velodyne in order to do this, like the Google car, for example, right? And um, now the interesting thing is that, you know, I think the computer vision should have a play, so it should have something to say here. And I guess we, uh, we believe on the, same, on the same things, right? And why is it interesting from a vision perspective, autonomous driving, is because if you want to do it, then basically you have to solve everything in computer vision, right? So it's a very interesting domain of application in order to build the next generation of systems. So you need to do uh, stereo optical flow, uh, right? visual odometry, distracted from motion. You need to sense the world. This is why I, I call sensing the world. You need to do uh, recognition of what you see. Right? You need to detect the objects. You need to recognize what they are specifically, category instances. Uh, and you need to track them over time. Right? You need to understand that this car is the same as the car in the next frame. Um, and you also need to basically understand the whole 3D scene, right? So it's a very, very rich problem to work in. Okay, so uh, one of the things, and this was done in col strong collaboration with uh, KIT, was uh, collecting data, right? So this was one of the four points that I put before. And uh, so you probably are all familiar with this, but I'm going to say it anyways, okay. And so basically we collect a data set, uh, right, a set of benchmarks to benchmark um, different problems in computer vision, and we did this uh, using different sensors, right? So we have Valadine, we have GPS, we have two stereo rigs. And the basic idea is that, you know, we want to evaluate methods that only use uh, cameras, but we need ground truth, right? So this is why we need the other sensors. All right, so this is just going to be a video of uh, the collection, and you're all going to recognize your own car, and you're going to recognize cars and whatnot. But the basic idea is collecting this, uh, this venture was to try to drive into different scenarios, including uh, you know, heavy traffic situations, uh, uh, you know, downtown, as we call it in America. And uh, so we put up this, this initial benchmark, which contains a stereo optical flow, visual odometry, 
and object uh, detection and soon, right, Philip, object tracking. Um, and the basic idea is that I actually try to come up with, uh, you know, not only this, uh, uh, this sort of benchmark, but also more, uh, you know, more on the semantic side. So the next generation of Kitty will actually be semantic parsing and other things, uh, what we hope to. Okay. So in order to create this data, what were the main uh, challenges? Um, that I guess Andreas and Philip need to deal with. Uh, so camera calibration was one of the problems, right? You have very different sensors and you need to relate them um, together. You also need to, in order to compute ground truth for the object, 3D object detection benchmark, uh, you know, we needed to annotate uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of instantaneous objects. And uh, so that caused you know, uh, a lot of effort in terms of you know, time of people annotating as well as money. Um, the, you know, building a sexy evaluation server was very important, right, I think. And Andreas did a fantastic job on this. And one of the interesting things that we see these days is that, you know, people are actually trying to cheat, right? So uh, even, you know, now we have to monitor that this is not happening. And I think we need some, some more robust ways to monitor this. Um, okay, so, so this is, you know, now that we have data, we can actually do something with it. Right, so what do we want to do? So the first thing is actually sensing the world, okay? Um, so one of the classic problems in sensing the world will be uh, stereo estimation, right? So I have two cameras mounted on top of the car. I'm an inter interested in reconstructing the environment, as you see here. Um, so how do the people address this, uh, this problem? And this is actually a very uh, simplistic and skewed view of the problem, okay? Uh, so basically, there are people that try to do local methods that look, uh, try to match locally uh, certain points. And uh, the problem of this is that you generally don't have global consistency. You suffer in textual regions, but you're going to be very fast. Um, then uh, MRFs were introduced in order to uh, uh, try to deal with this problem of you know, textual uh, regions and trying to impose some consistency. And the first attempts were actually at the pixel level. Uh, right, so an MRF basically you have uh, you can decompose in terms of an energy. Typically, this has uh, unary terms which are uh, basically based on local methods and per weight potentials, trying to say that if things are similar, they should be similar, something like that. So this is a particular instantiation of a Markov random field. Um, now the problem is that this is still too local, right? If I'm reasoning between different pixels, and it's computationally fairly expensive. I have a 10 mega megapixel. Uh, camera, right? So you have 10 million nodes in my graphical model. This is never going to work, you know, in real time or or even in hours. Okay, so um, uh, so a different approach, which is I think more interesting, uh, are these slanted plane MRF methods, where basically the idea is that I can consider that my world is piecewise uh, uh, planar, and that's actually a fairly good assumption if my planes are actually small. So instead of reasoning at the pixel level, I can reason at the segment level. And if I have a good um, over-segmentation of my image, this will be actually a good, uh, a good model. Um, now, in general, this is computationally expensive. Why is that? Because for every plane, you have a continuous uh, three-dimensional variable to fit, which is the plane. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what we did in this direction. Okay. Um, so typically, one of the main problems with the stereo is actually what happens in the occlusion boundaries. right? And uh, in a sense, um, this is related to the segmentation problem and the depth ordering problem. So what we tried to do uh, was to try, try to come up with a method or a, or a particular model that not only reasons at the segment level with uh, slanted planes, but also reasons about the boundaries between those slanted planes. And so the way to do this is basically to, given you know, uh, over-segmentation of the image, in this case in super pixels, probably you are all familiar with this, uh, this kind of over-segmentation, is to have a uh, random variable representing a slanted plane for each one, right? So this is piecewise planar in terms of, you know, this is a plane, right? It will be a plane in 3D. And we're going to have also, so these are continuous variables, and we are going to have discrete variables representing the interactions at the boundaries of those super pixels. So uh, these uh, this, uh, discrete variables are basically encoding whether two, super, uh, two planes are coplanar, whether they form a hinge, or whether they are, um, there is an occlusion boundary there, and what, who is occluding which. Okay? And this is going to be actually very interesting uh, because it's going to allow us to, to introduce 
you know, a couple of uh, interesting energy terms uh, in our full energy. So let me explain, explain what this energy actually is. So we need to define a, an energy over the set of all the, the segments in the image, as well as the set of all the uh, occlusion boundaries between neighboring superpixels. Um, and basically, so we have a first term that says that if we have similar color, we are likely to be coplanar. And this just comes from statistics. And in this case, uh, we did some statistics in Kitty, and this seems to be a very, a very natural prior. Um, the other thing that we have is a matching term, right? Saying that, let's assume that you can use any of the local methods as input, uh, so you would like your planes to be in accordance with the disparities that you have, right? So something very, very simple. And the nice thing about having the occlusion boundaries is that it allows you to reason about who owns the boundary. And this is actually important in practice. Um, what are the things we, we can uh, estimate? We can you know, have a, like an Occam Raison prior that says that uh, we should prefer simple explanations of the world. Right? So it's better to say that things are complainer than uh, say that they are hinged, that they are occluded. Right? Because the more complicated your model is, the better you're going to try to fit. But you will, you know, it's important to try to draw your level complexity, uh, your model complexity as low as possible. The other interesting thing is that we need to incorporate compatibility between these two types of random variables. And what is this compatibility saying here is that if uh, I say that they're complainer, then the segments should agree on the whole, on the two superpixels, right? If they are hinged, they should agree on the boundary, right? This is the definition of a hinge. And if they are occluded, well, the, the occluder has to be in front of the other one, right? So it's very, very simple type of encoding of potentials. And to me, probably the most interesting potential is that you can now reason about the physical validity of junctions. Right? So a junction is when you have three or more superpixels. And there is only certain configurations of these occlusion boundaries that are physically possible. So one example is if I say that this occludes this, and I say that this occludes this, right? so this one has to be occluded in this one. So you have this transitivity property. Um, so this is one of the examples. So you can actually enumerate, and this was something that Jitendra Malik did for his uh, PhD a long time ago, um, uh, about you know, which junctions are actually possible. OK, so um, who in the audience is familiar with the Marco Rando field learning and inference? Wow. One, two. OK, great. Three. So I can say a few words. Um, so in terms of, uh, so now we have a Marco Rando field, and we need to learn the parameters, which is which of these terms is more important, how much more important is, et cetera. And for this, uh, so we use uh, you know, some of the methods we have developed uh, for general uh, learning in, in Marco Random Fields. And the interesting thing of the methods we build is that, so typically, when you learn in these models, you need to do inference at every step of when you compute the gradients. And that's very, very computationally expensive. And so from the methods we develop, basically, we don't need to do this. We actually only need to do local updates. And I can tell you more details uh, uh, if you're in interested in. Now, the difficulty with this Marco Random Field that I show you is that it contains discrete and continuous random variables. And Marco Random Fields with continuous variables, in general, we only know how to solve when the potentials are Gaussian. So it's a very, very difficult problem to do inference over. Uh, so what we do is something very, very simple. It's something that we call particle convex belief propagation that works very, very well in practice. And we have some theoretical analysis uh, in some paper somewhere uh, in ICML 2011 on this. Uh, but the basic idea is that um, I'm going to sample particles, which are going to be discretizations of my continuous problem. I'm going to solve the Markov random field of the, the uh, resulting of these discretizations. And based on the solution of this discrete problem, I'm going to resample again. So you can think of this as a trade off between exploration and exploitation, right? I'm going to try to traverse my space, which is continuous, by doing this discretization. And as I said, this works very well in practice. It's not super fast, uh, I have to say. Um, OK, so this is the Kitty evaluation server, and I hope that, uh, that you can see. Uh, so this is actually the method I'm talking about. Um, so it works really, really well uh, in challenging scenarios. Um, so in terms of, uh, so you can see, it's fairly slow. Uh, hopefully, we will have soon a better, better algorithms to do this. Um, so this is the percentage of pixels which are uh, more, the, they have more than 3% error. And this is the average uh, for non-occluded and, and all the pixels in the image. 
So you see that actually the average error is really, really small. It's less than one pixel. OK, so when does this work? When it doesn't work? So it works pretty well in natural scenes, when you have lots of texture, when you don't have uh, you know, objects or anything. Um, and we do a couple of errors in thin structures. Why is this? Uh, because we are building this model in segments. Right. If your segmentation is not getting a super pixel at the pole, there is no way you're going to uh, get it correctly. And this is what you see uh, in the images. Um, shadows are actually something that help us. This is very interesting. You know, something that for recognition is a nightmare, actually, for, for stereo is good. Um, when it doesn't work, well, here you see this, this caravan thing, right? So specularity is uh, saturation, right? That's very, very difficult. Um, and you know, depth discontinuity is complicated geometries, etc. So, so despite, despite these numbers being, being fairly high, are actually, um, I think, better than existing techniques, even in the challenging uh, problems. OK, so, um, so this is you know, a stereo algorithm was where it w works pretty well. Um, but depth is not all, right? So when we say sense the environment, uh, motion is a very important source of information, right? So we would like to also recover the, the scene given a single camera. And so this is an example of Kitty. And in this case, this is ground truth uh, um, um, flow estimation. Uh, so this is a color coded of where uh, you know, the motion uh, goes. So, so in, in, in Kitty, one of the interesting things is that, and this is in general for uh, moving platforms, is that most of the scene is static, right? So you should use this information in order to get better flow estimation. And this is something that you know, some of you uh, have used, but it's something that we also use to build very similar models than the stereo, but for the case of flow. And so this is our new algorithm for flow that uh, works, um, works very well. It's uh, you know, slightly faster than the, than the stereo case. Uh, maybe our computers are better now than uh, last year. Um, but in general, it does you know, a fantastic job, I think, at, at estimating the, uh, um, the actual flow. And again, um, one of the main, main things that we use is, is, is the fact that most of the scene is, is static. Um, um, yeah, and I think these are not the, the latest results, actually. Uh, I, should, I should get those. Anyways, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it seems to be working very well. And it's a, you know, a general pipeline that you can use for you know, uh, this reconstruction type or geometry type uh, algorithms. OK, so, um, so now that we can sense the world, um, then the next thing that we would like to do is actually recognize the environment, right? So what's in the image? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we look into uh, is actually trying to do uh, holistic uh, scene understanding, right? This is, this is uh, one of my favorite problems. And the basic idea is that you want to reason about which objects are in the scene, so which class they are, where they are, how many we have, try to you know, uh, build a bounding box around those objects. You are also interested in segmentation, right? You would like to say for every pixel, what's the semantic category that it's associated with? And this is very important for driving, for example, if you are able to you know, segment well the road. Um, but there is not just road, right? There is cars, buildings, sky, whatever. Uh, a lot of different things. And the other thing that we were interested in is in scene classification. So given a scene, right, I would like to say that this is you know, somewhere in a city, for example. And you can see that these problems are actually not independent, right? They're super related. If I was able to say that this is a, you know, a, a scene of type city, I know that there's gonna be, not going to be any cow in my image, for example, right? So these statistics that I could use. If I, you know, if I know that uh, if I can segment uh, roughly you know, a, a car, then it's very easy to detect, right? I'm almost there. If I'm able to detect that there is a car and build a bounding box, then segmentation is easier because it's only figure ground segmentation, right? It's not about segmenting all possible classes. Um, so you can see that there is a lot of you know, uh, relationships between these problems. And this is why I think holistic approaches are very important. OK, so, um, so this, despite this, this, <laughs> this line of thought, the, the most uh, uh, used approach for semantic segmentation is the following. So you basically take a patch in the image, you build a classifier, 
for every patch, you will have you know, a score for every one of the classes. And maybe you, this, this patch classifiers, you, you put you know, some link in between, you build a little MRF saying that if they are similar, they should be similar. So you can see that this is a very, very difficult task, right? Like, do you know what this is? Right, yeah, so maybe it's bird, maybe it's water, maybe it's a cow, who knows, maybe it's grass. Um, however, if I give you the full image, it's very easy for humans uh, to actually say what this is. Right, so context is very important. That's another way to see these holistic models as being important. Um, um, yeah, so, so it turns out we did some uh, human studies and machines are better at the, you know, reasoning about little patches than humans. That was actually surprising. Um, and maybe we, this is just overfitting, okay? Um, all right, so, so this is an example, the same example. This is the ground truth. This is the MSRC uh, data set, which is a uh, uh, very well-known benchmark for se semantic segmentation. Um, this is the, if you use state-of-the-art semantic segmentation algorithm, right, it misses totally. This is using a deformable part-based model, which is the state-of-the-art in detection. So you see that you know, it puts basically classes everywhere, right? So it says there is a bird, another bird, there might be a, there might be a boat there, you know, there might be a person, all sorts of different things, and the scene you know, might actually be good in this case. So this is the result of our holistic model that I'm going to show you in a moment what it is. And you see that by reasoning about all these tasks together, we actually get a, you know, a nice, uh, nice segmentation out of, the, out of this. And obviously, I select a good case, but I'm going to show you some failure modes and, and some other cases. OK, so, um, so when I say joint inference, what are we trying to do? So we're going to try to uh, do inference over the type of scene, the whether a particular class is present on the image or not, which objects I see in the scene, as well as the semantic segmentation. Okay, so this is the task. And I'm going to use the same learning and inference tools that actually we built uh, uh, for the stereo. It's actually the same tools that we use for all the problems that I'm going to show you today. Okay, so, so we're going to build the step by step the holistic model, and we're going to build together the Markov random field. Okay? So the first thing that you need to do is to specify the random variables that you're going to use. Um, so in this case, what uh, we're going to do is reason about semantic segmentation by using, again, superpixels. But we're going to use superpixels as two levels of a hierarchy. And these superpixels actually are going to be big chunks. And the reason to do this is because I want an algorithm now that is going to be very efficient. So I'm going to show you some real-time uh, uh, inference results that you can do with this. OK, so every node, this is just a cartoon version of the MRF. OK, every node here is going to be representing the class associated with every one of my segments. OK? And this is the second level of the hierarchy, where you know, subsets here, are actually, um, sorry, sets of variables here are inside this big other segment. OK? Um, the, in order to reason about detection, I could do two things. I could, you know, really reason about where everywhere in the image detection could be, but this, could be, uh, this is going to be computationally very, very challenging. Or what I can do is run my object detector and then only reason about candidates. Right? So the object det detector is going to output a whole bunch of detections, typically, let's say, 20, 60 per image of different classes. And I'm going to reason with a random variable for each one of those detections whether they were correct or not. Okay, is this clear? And the other thing I'm going to have is I'm going to have nodes for which classes are present in the scene. Okay, so I will have one node for cow, one node for car, one node for um, sky, etc. The uh, the last node on the graph is basically representing the type of scene. Okay, and now the question is how are these random variables related? Right. So the first thing to do is okay. Uh, well, if I were to solve every task independently, I already have a good source of information. Right, so we're going to uh, build unary potentials for every one of the tasks based on the individual task alone. So for the object detection, I will use the score of the detector, for example. For the semantic segmentation, I will use you know, the classifiers that people use in the literature. OK, so now let's try to connect these, these random variables. Um, so I say that these are big segments that contain small segments. So what I would like to encode, for example, is that the big segments, the labeling of the big segments should agree with the small segments. Right? This is very natural. So this is very simple. You can encode this very, very simply. 
The next thing that I would like to say is that, well, all these random variables have to be compatible, right? So if I say, you know, in my segmentation that it is cow, then the cow variable has to be on saying there is a cow present in the image, right? So I need to encode this, this type of potential there. Um, I can also encode statistics about the problem. And this I can encode, you know, in concurrences of classes, right? And this typically encodes the fact that grass and cow co-occur together much more than cow and computer, right? Uh, this is also a very important source of information. So the next thing, uh, I need to also incorporate compatibility between detection and the class, uh, classes present in the scene. And this basically says that if my detector says that there is a cow, again, I should say that there is a cow in the image. Right, so I'm trying to link all these tasks together in a, in a, so that when I do inference, right, everything is compatible and all the tasks influence each other. So one of the interesting potentials that we add is that between detection and uh, the segmentation is based on the fact that uh, if you use the formal part-based model, you can actually use a shape mask of the component that fire. And that gives you a very interesting you know, source of information of you know, which pixels you are supposed to color with that particular class. So we build potentials based on this type of shape masks. And so the last bit of the MRF here basically says that um, condition on the scene, there are certain classes that are more probable than others. And this was the, the case that I said, in a, in a human scene, you are probably not going to see cows. Right? So the encode uh, I have a, something that looks like a complicated Markov random field, but it's actually very, very simple. So I'm going to show you some, some results. And the, the, the part that is more, so this is uh, learning time and inference time. The part that is more interesting is that you can beat the state of the art by using only one minute to train the whole system. And it takes on average 20 milliseconds to do inference over each image. Okay, So you can actually have this you know, run in real time in your autonomous platform. And the other thing that was very interesting to see is that the fact that we do holistically, we actually improve the different, all the different tasks uh, that we have. So we do better in segmentation, we do better in a sync classification, and we do better in detection. So these are just some examples of uh, images, ground truth. These are the, uh, uh, only if you do segmentation, this is a, the detector, you see you know, that it fires everywhere, and this is the output of our system. Okay, this is again, uh, you know, hand pick good results. These are some other results. And let me just explain you some, some failure modes. Uh, so when does the, this thing fail? So it typically fails when, in this case, right, so I have a dog here. The detector says this is a person, right? If you think about, you know, SIF features or something, right? Or hog features actually looks pretty much like a person. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so the detection says, says the person, the segmentation uses color. And this looks like a skin, right? Actually it says it's a person, right? So two out of three components saying it's a person, then this thing is actually going to say it's a person. And actually, if I just show you this, you probably almost have guessed that it was a person. Um, anyways, so sometimes it's also, you know, the, just the, the potentials are, you know, the, um, you know, there's too much noise in the system, so it, so it fails as well. OK, so the next thing that uh, I wanted to do was actually when you, you, you know, you're trying to, to do a, um, autonomous systems, in a sense, then you will, you know, I would like to be more interactive while parsing the scene. And let me explain you in a second what I mean by this. Um, so, so one of the, you know, the key questions is how, once you have autonomous, let's say, a robot, how are you going to teach your robot new concepts? How are you going to, you know, when it makes mistakes, how, how are you going to interact in order to say you, you have made a mistake? So the typical, you know, active learning pipeline right now is to say that, you know, I'm going to label, you know, where you made a mistake, for example, in segmentation. And that's not something that is going to be possible, right? Uh, nobody's going to uh, buy a robot if I have to segment by hand, you know, every time it makes a mistake. Uh, so the kind of interaction that I think is going to be very interesting to, to look into is the following one. So, you know, the teacher says to the, you know, to the robot, oh, you know, can you bring me my mug? You know, I'm thirsty. And then the robot is well trained and knows that, you know, us girls love to be praised. So, you know, it's going to say all sorts of, you know, uh, interesting things. And then it's going to go and, you know, 
uh, look for the for the mag, and you know the teacher is going to be happy, um, and you know it's going to bring something, and maybe it's not a mag, right? So maybe the robot made a mistake. So basically, um, the teacher should say, okay, that's uh, you know that's not my mag, and it's going to give some important information about what the task is, right? So it's going to say, okay, my mag is in the kitchen next to the pile of dishes you should clean, right? So it's giving two sources of information: a task, which is you know you should also clean the dishes. But it's also saying that you know my mug is in the kitchen. That's a very good uh, source of information, and also that it's next to a pile of dishes. So if I am able to detect the dishes, I should be able to locate the mug there. Okay. So this is the kind of information I'm 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 trying to to go after. Uh, is this clear? All right. So if you want to do this, what do you need to do? Well, you need to understand language. Right. For, well, first you have to do a speech recognition, but I'm not going to go into that. Once you do a speech recognition, assume that you did that perfectly. Then you need to actually parse the sentences and understand what it means. Right. And given that, then you need to extract the pieces of information from the sentences that are good for your semantic parsing. Right. So there's like this two-level thing. Um, um, so, so I'm going to show you some results. I'm not going to show you how we actually do this. Okay. And uh, so here, you know, you have a sentence, and this is the kind of parsing that we automatically do. Um, uh, so for those of you that are not familiar with natural language processing, basically you see here the sentence. You have a part of a speech tag uh, associated with every one of the words. For example, uh, this is a determinant, and you have a parse tree uh, analyzing the syntactic uh, structure of the sentence. Right, this is a noun phrase, this is a noun phrase, verb phrase with preposition, etc. Right? So, so we can parse these things automatically. And given this, parse, uh, this parsing, we're going to try to extract um, information about which categories I'm talking about that are my categories of interest. Also, about what's the relationship between the objects of interest. How many objects of interest do I have? Um, and what are the attributes of these objects of interest? Okay, so an example, uh, a sheep dog and two sheep walking in a field. So this is particular nasty, nasty uh, sentence. But from this, I should be able to infer there is one dog, or at least one dog, right? Uh, there are two sheep, uh, and they are walking in the field, so probably they are nearby, right? So this is the kind of information we would like to extract. Okay, so I said I will only show results. So here, um, this is the uh, Pascal uh, VOC challenge, which is the main challenge for object detection and semantic segmentation. Um, uh, so this is the original image. This is ground truth. This is the holistic approach that I showed you before. Okay, in in this case, uh, running Pascal, and this is if we use te text as well. Okay. And everything here is automatic. Okay, so given the sentences, it's going to parse the sentences, you know, modify the MRF to use this information, um, and then come up with a better solution. Okay, this is another example. Um, and you know, some of the sentences, are, some of the sentences are actually very simple. Some of the sentences are actually fairly complicated. Uh, this is another example. Um, so you see here that it's able to get the train much where this is actually a different category. OK, in this case, the table. Uh, so it's able to get the table bare. Um, so in this scenario, uh, so you can think of you know, how to correct this, this parsing by saying, hey, you missed the chairs. There are three, right? And then given that new information, I'm sure that we are able to detect some, some chairs there. Right, so you can see that it's a very simple uh, way to interact. Uh, with the semantic labeling. OK, so now in terms of results, how well do we do? Um, so uh, this is a, the, our unary potentials for the MRF. This is the holistic model that I showed you before that only uses visual information. Um, and this is when you use sentences. So you can actually do way, way better by using this information. And this is actually the UA UC sentence data set. It's a very challenging data set because you only have 600 images for training. Uh, in Pascal VOC, you have 10,000 images for training in the full Pascal. So, so these numbers are really, really high. Uh, the other thing that you can see is whether this actually improves detection. And, and this is something that, since we are doing this holistic model, right, we are also reasoning about detection. And this is as a function of how many sentences I use 
for training and testing. Right? At test time, I also have sentences. And you see that with e only one or two sentences, we can do actually much better. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, so I mainly talk about uh, you know, autonomous driving and a little bit about robots now. I'm going to show you one last thing about how to do also very, uh, sorry, in, in the, sorry, in the sentence case, we can also do it in real time. Okay, so I forgot to say that. Um, okay, so in in the um, so in the indoor scenario, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, is very interesting to have is actually the uh, okay, um, the space that you can navigate, right? And um, so for reasoning about the space that that you can navigate, there are two things that you you need to obtain. One is the overall space, let's assume that you know, these are rooms, right? So what's the space in this room in 3D, as well as where are the objects uh, that are actually occupy any space in 3D, right? So the um, difference between the two will actually be where I can actually navigate. Um, so this is a, um, so I'm gonna talk about the first thing, not, not about the objects. So this is a problem that was popularized uh, uh, recently in computer vision, which is I have a single image uh, of a scene, and I'm interested in extracting the um, 3D cuboid, so this is gonna be rooms, the 3D cuboid that best fits uh, that particular image, okay? So you see here this room, right, this will be the 3D cuboid, in this case it's like this, and in this case this is the best 3D cuboid. Okay, so is this problem clear? Yeah. All right, so, um, so you can also frame this thing as structure prediction. You can build your Markov random field. Uh, you know, nothing changes there. Um, the interesting thing of what we did was to show that actually you can, for the energies that people uh, build before, um, where they were doing um, approximated inference with only a few candidates, we can actually look for the optimal solution, and we can do this really, really fast. And uh, so the approach that we build is actually six orders of magnitude faster than any approximate solution of other, of other groups. Um, so how do we do this? Um, so how many of you are familiar with branch and bound? Ooh, okay, great. Um, so it's a very simple algorithm. Um, and the uh, basic idea is that uh, you need to parameterize your problem in terms of sets of possible hypotheses. Right, and then basically you're gonna have a priority queue which tells you what is the set of hypotheses between all my sets that is the more, pro more promising set, okay? And give it that most promising set, then basically you're gonna refine on that direction, okay? So basically the algorithm will go as follows. I will start with my hypothesis set being the whole set, right? Everything is possible as a solution. Then uh, I'm gonna iterate the following thing. I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna take the most promising thing on my queue. Uh, basically, um, uh, I'm gonna split that set into two. I'm gonna recompute a bound of these two sets, and I'm gonna put it back on my priority queue, okay? So basically, you have a scoring function, you have a bounding function, and uh, the idea is that you keep on splitting until you end up with a single solution. And when on top of your priority queue, you have a single solution, this is the optimal of your problem. Okay, is this clear, more or less? Should I do it again? No, it's clear. Okay, that basically you split, you bound each one independently, you put it in the queue in whatever order it is, you take the top, you split again, right? And if your bounds are tight, you can prove that this is optimal, okay? So what do I need in order to do the problem I showed you before with this approach? Well, I need a parametrization in terms of sets of hypotheses. I need a scoring function, right? I need to be able to say whether something is good or not. And I need bounds, right, in order to put this in the priority queue. Now, in terms of bounds, um, I need two things. Uh, they need to be tight, because if they are not tight, I'm gonna explore everywhere in the space, and that's not gonna be efficient, right? The worst case complexity of this algorithm is exponential. You go over all, single, all possible hypotheses. Um, the other thing is I need it to be efficient. Even if I only need to compute three, you know, three bounds, if it takes me 10 hours to compute each bound, you know, this is not gonna work, right? Okay, so, so let me explain how we do this. Uh, so in terms of parametrization of the problem, so it's gonna be very simple. Um, 
so we are going to first compute the vanishing points. OK? And condition, so that we assume this is Manhattan world, right? It's in the scenarios, it's not too bad. And given these three vanishing points, we only require four random variables to represent this problem, which are you can cast two rays originating from this vanishing point and another two originating from this vanishing point. Right? This defines a, uh, this thing here. right? And given the intersection of the rays and the other vanishing point, that also defines the rest of the cuboid. So you see this as a, as a room. Right, I hope so. Uh, this is the front wall, left wall, ceiling, uh, bottom, right, floor, and the ray wall. Okay, and you see that I only need these these four angles: y one, y two, y three, y four, right, plus the vanishing points. So, um, but this is a parameterization of a single layout, right? Uh, so I need to parameterize sets. So the simplest thing, and it's going to help us bound things, is in terms of yes intervals. You know, from where to where these rays I'm going to consider. Right, so at the beginning, you're gonna, your interval will be all the possible possibilities in each, one, in each direction. Okay? Is this parameterization clear? Yeah. Great. Um, now I have to build my scoring function. I need to say whether a layout is good or not. Uh, so for this, uh, we need image features. And we use uh, image features from the literature. I said I'm just going to take the energy from somebody else. Um, uh, so one of them is geometric context, and another one is orientation maps. And you can, you can think of these features as just saying, for every pixel, a probability or a score or a label that tells you the rough orientation of that pixel. So this is like a noisy version of the layout estimation I want to do. OK? So what's going to be my scoring function? So my scoring function has to depend on, on the hypothesis, right? So my scoring function is going to count for every phase the number of pixels which are yellow, number of pixels which are uh, green, blue, red, etc. Right? And when I learn this, I'm going to learn that I want to maximize the number of yellow pixels on the left wall. I'm going to maximize the number of green pixels on the front wall. Right? I'm going to minimize the other colors on those, uh, on those walls. Right? OK. So. Um, so the, in order for this algorithm to be exact, I need to have upper bounds, and I need the bound to be exact when I have a single hypothesis. So if I'm able to, to follow these two criteria, I'm going to have an exact algorithm. Um, so let me explain you the trick of how we do this, which is really, really simple. Um, so the first thing to notice is that we count features. So our features are always going to be positive. So we only need to actually reason about the actual weights that we learn. But what I can do is I can expli split my function into the positive side and the negative side. Okay? And I'm going to bound differently the positive and the negative. So, so forget about the formulas. Just try to get the intuition, okay? hopefully. Um, OK, so I can bound the positive uh, independently of the negative. And uh, the sums of bounds is a possible bound. And I can actually do this over the faces as well. So how do I bound a single face? Uh, so if my feature is negative, the, um, the best possible thing is actually to take the smaller face, right? Because this will, this will have the smallest possible contribution. If my features are positive, I have the biggest possible face in my interval because this is the biggest possible contribution, right? So it's a very, very simple to bound these, these terms. And in order to, to compute this uh, fast, we have a trick, which is basically a generalization of integral images to, to 3D geometry. And uh, um, so one uh, a simple example of how to think about this is that if you want to compute this phase, you can do it by computing this area and subtracting this area. So you basically have accumulators that you, you keep on adding and subtracting. Um, and if you're interested, I can give you details later. Uh, it's a little bit cumbersome. Now, uh, in terms of uh, performance-wise, uh, so this works better than, than the state of the art. And why? Because we solve this problem exactly, and we can have more hypotheses. But the interesting thing is that it takes, on average, seven milliseconds per image to solve every one of these problems, where the approximate solutions were in the orders of 10, 10 minutes or so. Right? So it's six orders of magnitude faster, and you know, it gives you the optimum. And these are just some examples, and you can oops, you can actually have uh, 
3D reconstructions out of it. Um, so, and then you, you can do like, you know, this kind of visualizations in 3D. Um, so it's a cuboid. Whenever you have objects, you're going to see that the objects are you know, projected flat into the wall. So it's not going to look like this is a bed, I think, uh, or a sofa maybe. So it doesn't look very good there. Um, so the next thing that we are actually doing is reasoning also about the uh, 3D objects as well. So our first attempt to do exact inference over objects went from 7 milliseconds to 11 hours per image. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated to, to do this. But in general, you have you know, a nice 3D sense of, of the room. And remember, this is a single monocular image. Uh, so it's a very difficult problem. OK, so, um, so I show you some computationally efficient and some less computationally efficient methods uh, that result in pretty good performance for reconstruction. So I show stereo and very little about flow. Uh, recognition, right? So I show you holistic parsing and this inner layer estimation. And so what was the key of making this, uh, particularly the, the recognition part fast, was actually the representations that we use, as well as having good learning and inference algorithms. Uh, and also the benchmarks, right, uh, in order to do learning and comparisons. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I did, or my group did in the past, that I haven't talked about, uh, like human post estimation, 3D detection. I didn't talk about anything of the machine learning side. Um, so again, yeah, I'm here again tomorrow, so if you're interested, uh, I will be happy to talk about. And there's so many things to do, and it's, it's you know, the, you know, there's a lot of doors open to look into the interplay between these, these two, this recognition and reconstruction. Um, so instead of, you know, enumerating, you know, the, the feature work and whatnot, I'm going to actually show you two things that I, that I think are pretty cool, and I hope you like. Uh, so the first thing is what we call, I guess we shouldn't call visual GPS since you guys call visual GPS something else. Um, but the idea is that uh, when humans, we arrive to a new place, we use a map of the environment and we walk around in order to decide where we are. So we wanted to uh, see whether we can do something similar uh, in order to self-localize our autonomous uh, car. Uh, I guess your autonomous car. Um, and the uh, idea here is that we are only going to use visual odometry, so an es estimation of uh, um, the ego motion of the car, in order to try to self-localize ourselves. In, let's say this is the map of Kazru. Okay, so the surprising part of this was actually that we were able to self-localize ourselves uh, um, uh, after only around 20 seconds of driving, uh, with a precision of three meters um, in maps that contain as much as 2,000 kilometers of drivable space. Okay, and, um, and we validate this basically in Kitty, but I'm just gonna show you an example of, uh, of this. So before, before I show you the example, I'm gonna um, try to explain what you're gonna see in the visualization. Um, so what you're gonna see basically is a, with these circles, is the ground truth location. In black, you're going to see the GPS trajectory, which we don't use. OK, this is considered ground truth. And you're going to see in color the distribution of where the algorithm thinks that you might be. OK? And, and oops, let me just. Let me start from the beginning. So you see at the beginning, there is a lot of possible locations where you can be. But as you drive, right, there is turns, there are intersections, there are things that, you know, uh, there's cur curves that are very distinctive of where you actually are. Um, so it's able, in this case, to localize like really, really quickly. And once it localized, you know, it's very stable to say what it is. Uh, so this is another example. There's more Manhattan world beginning. You know, you could be everywhere. And after a little bit of driving, you know, it's able to say where it is. And so we did this with um, a stereo monocular visual odometry. So with a stereo is three meters, uh, monocular is 18, 13, 14, something like that. Um, so this is an interesting case where uh, it's very Manhattan world. And actually, there are two possibilities that are equally probable until you arrive to a point where this you could only have done it if you were in this street, right? And then it gets to a single mode of the distribution.
So you can think of this as a maybe substitute or coordinated way to work with GPS. OK. So while I take questions, if you have, I'm just going to show you the latest about you know, um, autonomous, more like autonomous driving intersection detection. Um, and what you're going to see here is uh, we use a single uh, video sequence. You're going to see the detected objects and tracks and the estimated uh, geometry in 3D as well as the uh, where the cars are in 3D um, is color coded of which lane we think that the car is. And here is the traffic pattern that we infer also automatically in this intersection. Okay. So here's our car that was moving, and so you can see that you know, despite um, so in this case we don't we don't reason about you know uh, long trajectory occlusion. I think this is the, the next thing to do. So I mean, it's it's fairly difficult to infer uh, you know intersections in this case, and it's able to do a fairly good job at, at doing that. Um, so in the new model, uh, you know, cars can actually be in different lanes. Um, that's interesting, and again, you know, the traffic pattern that is inferred, you know goes a little bit more towards what can our car do given this traffic, right? this traffic signalization. And some of the sequences are fairly difficult in, in terms of the recognition. Right? Anyways, this is the last part I wanted to show you. Um, uh, no, 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 this is uh, automatically inferred. This, yeah, yeah, everything is automatically inferred. Yeah, so it's the, I guess, the next generation of uh, um, our work. Um, anyways, if you have any questions or, or you're bored to death. <laughs> Too many things. <laughs> hmm? Is this an end of the or is it going to end? So what? It's going to end at some point, yeah. You have a long way. <laughs> I can end it any time. <laughs> this is the end of the presentation. Yeah. <laughs>